Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to continue on from the previous upload I made that discussed some of the writings in the book The Bliss of the Celiate by Julian Lee and The Bliss of the Celibate by Julian Lee and as I said in the previous video um, I'd also like to discuss some chapters that I didn't have the chance to in the previous video so in this one I'd like to talk about the the differences between men and women um, in spiritual and material life and the advantages and disadvantages that both have when it comes to sexuality and spirituality and also at the end I'd like to cover a note on um, the current state of men and women in society in terms of their, their sexuality, their spirituality, um, their morality I guess you could say and also how the downfall of the male is impacting on women's mindset and psychology um, but also how men's returning to virtue will inevitably um, bring women back to virtue also so I won't reveal any more than that I'll just get right into it so the first chapter here is going to talk about the, the benefits of, of being a male and then the next chapter is more of a, a comparison between men and women and um, in case you haven't watched the, the previous video uh, I would suggest you go watch that first and then watch this one but essentially this book Bliss of the Celibate um, I only read it like within the last week and I, um, I found it to be very compelling a lot of truth and wisdom in it I didn't agree with everything in the book particularly the uh, the analysis Julian Lee provided of history and, and his overemphasis what I felt was overemphasis of man's downfall on sex alone when I feel that there's actually a lot of more a lot more factors than just sex involved and, and lust um, but basically the book is about the benefits of semen retention and celibacy uh, for men particularly like obviously semen retention is only something that guys can do but more generally when talking about celibacy um, that, would, that would apply to both men and women and Julian Lee he, he the book is for both men and women I guess you could say but it's particularly focused on men and I listed out the benefits that, that he um, lists himself of semen retention and celibacy in my previous video so go check that out if you haven't seen it yet um, there's a lot of benefits to, to sexual restraint to retaining the seed as a man particularly I think it goes back to like the the metaphysics or the archetypes between men and women you know it goes back to yin and yang so yang being the masculine principle it's limited you know it's prone to depletion um, whereas the yin, that feminine essence, it's more inherently abundant and um, that shows up in, in sexuality whereby women can um, can orgasm um, more readily than men and not be depleted right away but interestingly as Julian Lee puts forth in this book and I, I it was kind of something I hadn't thought about previously he posits that the female period is like the equivalent of a male ejaculation in that you know there's similar symptoms so when a woman you know a woman gets PMS like pre-menopausal um, or yeah I can't, I can't remember the exact name of that but PMS it's, it's to do with the period and the, the menopause as well I think and you know each time a woman has a period each month like she goes through certain symptoms like moodiness like cravings you know um, anger issues you know lack of focus all of this kind of thing and he drew a parallel with the male ejaculation but the difference is that men choose to ejaculate consciously like they don't have to if they don't want to um, and that ejaculation like the the semen is the vital essence of man you know it's it's what carries all of his his chutzpah if you will you know his 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 confidence his vigor his vitality and also just more scientifically like a load of nutrition and um, all of that but I'm not I'm not really drawn to that side of things personally myself you know I, I look at things more through energy and I I see the semen just as having potent en energy within it that it, it, it's a sacred fluid and that 
men in this day and age they squander it you know uh, recklessly and that's what leads to a lot of problems for guys you know and for society uh, as a result of that so without further ado I'll uh, start reading through this chapter here it's called the good fortune of a male birth so the special advantages of being male in spiritual and material life how men forfeit this advantage and the differences between the male and female emotionally and spiritually it starts off here with a quote by Paramahansa Yogananda which says ever fed never satisfied never fed ever satisfied he's talking about the sexuality of man this material was written from a male perspective and men are sexually very different from women also it is more difficult to attain celibacy and sexual self-restraint for a male however when he attains it the effects on him are immediately greater this is because when a male has, has an orgasm, he has an enormous loss of life substance in the form of the procreative pearls. When a man has sex, something issues forth from his body and is lost. This is not so for the woman. In bodily terms, the woman is the actual winner in the sex act, the male is the actual loser. Now if you've watched my previous video on this book, you'll notice that this is the same starting point, but it's going to diverge after this, um, after these few paragraphs. What issues forth is the most potent and sacred substance in his body, much richer than his blood. One of the most ignorant features of the modern mind is the failure to analyse this or to appreciate this loss, or to comprehend its impact on man. All ancient cultures where life moved slowly and people observed things did not miss the fact that in the male orgasm something is lost and given up. They also did not miss the fact that this loss has a tremendous effect on the male. The Taoist culture that emerged in ancient China, the Vedic culture of India, and almost all of the indigenous cultures clearly apprehended the significance of the loss of semen for the male and its effects on him, both in subtle and obvious terms. The next sutra will be a revelation to Westerners. It is easier for a woman to become a celibate physically, but it is difficult, more difficult for her emotionally. It is harder for a man to become a celibate physically, but it is easier for him emotionally. I guess this speaks to the fact that men are men have a very high sex drive and we're very visually stimulated you know so we we are drawn to the visual um of women particularly in our sex addicted state which we all are in i believe that when we're in a more natural state uh, which we don't really have the reference for in our current society because we're all trained to be sex addicts when we're in a more natural state that isn't absolutely addicted to sex our view of women starts to change and we're actually not like ra rabid dogs when it comes to visual stimulus and seeing women you know we can we can see them as human beings and Judy and me talks about that somewhere else in the book maybe I'll cover it in this video we'll see um, but that's what he's saying there but the thing is and this is you see that this is where the advantages and disadvantages between men and women come in you know and there's like a an almost perfect balance between the two so whereas men are men have more of a, a spiritual struggle or fight when it comes to overcoming the physical desires when it comes to the emotional element men are more sturdy you know we are we have the tendency to be more emotionally strong and capable and independent um whereas it's the complete opposite for the woman like she the woman doesn't struggle so much with the physicality like the woman women aren't really visually um women aren't attracted to to looks or to the physical nearly as much as men are women are more drawn to um emotion um sometimes status a little bit of status but for the most part emotion um how does a man make her feel and as a result of this you know it's easier for a woman to become a celibate physically and um, they can go without sex you know they don't necessarily crave it as much as the man although i think in modern society they do and that's talked about later on as well um, but in terms of emotion it's much more difficult for a woman to be let's say independent or to go without that emotional connection you know because women are hardwired for that so men can you know there's this image of like the lone wolf like men can kind of go off and do their own thing and they can undergo severe austerity like self-imposed austerity and that's actually 
a brilliant thing for a man like a man grows through that and a man almost revels in that in a strange sense but that's much harder for a woman in general obviously there's there's um you know exceptions to the rule but those are the rules in general so when a man succeeds in becoming a celibate the effects on him are greater because of the storing up of his sexual substance and energy women do not usually develop the intense desire for sex common to man on the other hand women who are around sex obsessed men long enough which means most women today will eventually become like him sex obsessed man corrupts the mind of the female along with other men but just as the desire for sex is not naturally as strong in women, so too the desire for celibacy does not often emerge in the female as compellingly as in the man who finally figures out his situation. First of all, sex desire tends not to become such a problem for the female, causing such negative consequences. In fact, the woman benefits physically and metaphysically through sex with the male, as she absorbs his creative tissue. The, other, the man, on the other hand, when sunk into sex addiction is in a desperate situation something firm needs to be done then the same warrior spirit found in the male is utilized in the battle for celibacy it is because of the male warrior spirit that a male is able to win this battle there are other reasons women don't pursue celibacy as avidly a woman normally views celibacy as counter to her natural interest in human relationship if we take the Garden of Eden story as guidance, we could speculate that Eve, created after man in the story, appears to have been created for the very sake of relationship. In astrology, the planet Venus is considered to be synonymous with female. The planet Venus is also the ruler over matters of relationship. So relationship is the special province of the female. Because sex appears to be an important ingredient in a relationship to the male, Renouncing sex entirely may seem like death itself to her. Later I will talk about the ways women are not only disinterested in celibacy, but also hostile to the idea in men. For now we are talking about the fact that a male will take the celibacy more readily than a woman. Note. I speak with many women who describe themselves as celibate, Often what they mean is that they have been lacking, or doing without sex, involuntarily through the lack of a suitable mate. This is a misuse of the term. Celibacy is a conscious, voluntary choice regarding sex itself, and not just the unfortunate result of a lack of a suitable mate. A person who is celibate will stay celibate even if 100 desirable mates line up to offer themselves. Celibacy is a proactive choice you make, not an unfortunate deprivation. Now, I will note there that the author is talking about pure celibacy in that regard. He's talking about foregoing relationships and, even in its pure sense, foregoing sexual thought. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video on this book that I uploaded, celibacy, as addressed by the author in this book, is really a spectrum of behaviours. So it's not just this version of celibacy that he's talking about here, which is like that pure saintly celibacy that you'd associate with yogis and priests and things like that and monks and nuns but rather it's something that starts for men with the practice of semen retention and you know engaging in that inner relationship as well you know whether that be true karetza, um, which is a form of sex where the male does not ejaculate or things like things that are pretty much the same like coitus reservatus um, tantric yoga, tantric, sex, um, Taoist sexual techniques, which are all, all of those practices have pretty much one thing in common, which is that the man and the woman have sex, but the man uh, retains his seed during the act. One can also observe that Adam was the only one of the two who was ever alone. Later, he became the hunter, facing lonely situations in search for his family and tribe. Though men also hunted in groups, solitude in pristine environments was more often his lot than for the females who stayed back at the roiling village or camp. Thus the male body has a solitude program built into it, and human relationship is not vital to him like air. Also, this is why the male is usually less of a talker than the female. 
Males tend to appreciate and seek real solitude more often than the female, who is inherently social in general. In fact, solitude may be as vital to the male as companionship is for the female. Now, solitude benefits the one seeking celibacy, and man has an enlarged capacity for solitude. Thus, he is both more inclined to seek it and has an advantage in attaining it. Celibacy has greater impact on a man because the energy he is harnessing, his sexual energy, runs quote-unquote hotter than in woman. Also, upon pursuing celibacy, there is a more dramatic result in males because of the depletion of his physical and spiritual resources that existed before, the exit from his chronic equivalent of PMS. Woman, on the other hand, though she pursues celibacy, is not coming from such a depleted state. She only loses once monthly. The woman has always been a more even personality than the sexing male. When a sex addict man stops sexing, he, becomes, he begins to become more even too, and the change is noticeable. Finally, it is obvious the fact that a man can choose to stop his sexual loss entirely, whereas a woman is normally obligated to have the loss 13 times a year. Thus, when a man refrains from sexual loss for several months, he begins to rapidly regain lost moral ground and spiritual and emotional strength. As it builds up month by month, it becomes a tremendous resource with many benefits for him and others. The best of these benefits relate to meditation, the spiritual life and liberation. This ability of the male to cease from discharge is the reason the male is ascribed a higher station in many of the religious scriptures of the world, including the Bhagavad Gita of Krishna. And it is the sexual indifference, and not simply his aggressiveness, that made man the superior of women in the cultures of the past. On the other hand, any man who sexes more than once a month is automatically inferior to any woman. That means almost all men today. Because this is an actual fact and not an opinion, we can see women making unheard of inroads today and actually taking over the world. And on the other hand, a female yogi directing her shakti up the spine over a long time will eventually cease from having her period. And there are cases of female saints like this. The main point above is that celibacy has a more immediate, noticeable and useful effect upon men, but this is partly because man has been in such a low condition for so long. Both men and women can become saints and know God directly, and they each have special advantages pertaining to their sex. The things I am saying in this work on celibacy will imply to some that in the higher spiritual life, males have an advantage over females. This brings up the question of equality of the sexes and the question, is either the male or the female inherently superior to the other? We need to digress to consider this question. But first, let's address the question generally with some important facts. Men are superior to women in some ways and inferior in others. Women are superior to men in some ways and inferior in others. They each have different advantages in the spiritual life. We will look at these later. Okay, I think I read that wrong. So men are superior to women in some ways and inferior in others. Women are superior to men in some ways and inferior in others. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that all can know him and explicitly includes women. There have been many great female saints having the highest station of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Examples, Saint Teresa of Avila, Anada Maya Ma, the living saint Karuna Mai, all beings strive for the ultimate, all beings strive for no limits, all strive to realize Brahman. It is the desire of all beings to attain the Absolute, it is the destiny of all beings to know the Absolute. Most women have been men in past incarnations, and most women have and most men have been women in past incarnations. This makes the question of equality less relevant. However, in this physical incarnation, does a male have an advantage over the female? Answer. Again, the male has unique spiritual advantages over the female, and the female has unique spiritual advantages over the male. But this is only in terms of the initial progress along the path, 
As the path goes deeper, these distinctions fade. The sages say that the attainment of all saints is the same. The consciousness of Nirvikalpa Samadhi is the same. There is not a male Samadhi and a female Samadhi. The absolute is beyond sexual difference. Since both males and females attain Samadhi, they must have the same spiritual potential. The actual creation itself is the result of the male-female principles together. Without the male-female principles, the creation would not exist. This also implies an ultimate equality. As you approach God, you become both male and female, androgynous. This is why Krishna is depicted as androgynous. So that the one coming near to God, the question of sex becomes irrelevant. But does a man have an advantage in coming nearer to God? Answer. The man does have an advantage at the beginning because of his intensity, vigor, and the immediate pronounced effects of conserving ojas when he really takes to the path. But fewer men sincerely take to that path than women. Another point. Sages say to view everything with equality. This means that rotten food is really the same as good food. A fly is the same as an eagle. The, sa the slave is the same as a master. But this is from a cosmic point of view. There are other pra lower practical points of view that have to do with the functioning and orderliness of nature, the functioning and orderliness of society. At the level of mind, society and dharma, this no differences teaching has little practical importance. In evolution there are indeed some species with sweeping advantages over others on a scale of evolution. Is the male on a higher station of evolution having similar advantages in the spiritual realm as he is shown in the spiritual? Is this his proper place as implied by most scriptures and dharmic civilizations of the past? I mean, I am indeed saying this is true, as history and scriptures also indicate, yet I also want to state later my opinion that the female has qualities and powers inherent to her that are special to her as a general class, that give her spiritual advantages over the male. There is no doubt that there are great female saints, but there is also no doubt that there have been more male saints. Also note that the spiritual greatness of the female is usually predicated on the spiritual greatness of some past or current male, that this is no accident or result of oppressive history. I will remark on a woman's special spiritual nature, but before I can do this I need to address the growing delusion of female superiority that is actually overtaking our culture at this time. Finally. Men and women have equal opportunity before God in the spiritual attainment realm. Like the hare, the male who finally becomes spiritually focused often moves faster, but the tortoise with his steady progress also arrives. Men with spiritual interests are less common than women with spiritual interests. Also, the male's spiritual progress appears to be more externalized, manifesting in external worldly structures and systems. This correlates with the idea that the male sexual organ is external, the woman's internal. The man is inherently rajasic, pushing outwards and also manifests his spiritual progress more noticeably in the external realm. But this, do this does not negate the reality of the female spiritual attainment, which is often more hidden. In fact, churches and such are really a male thing. The female is naturally gifted with a more sattvic nature than the average man. Sattvic males are more rare, and when they appear, they make a bigger splash in the world. The wise female should not be interested in the external splash, covet it, or let it be the indicator of her own spiritual progress. Advantages of the typical male Intensity and strenuousness once interested in the spiritual life. Greater attraction to celibacy once interested in it. Ability to begin immediately storing up ojas or sexual energy for the upward ascent of the spine. Natural capacity for detachment, renunciation and solitude. Greater intellectual acuity, intellectual discrimination and penetration of scriptural truths. Advantages of the typical female. More interest in spiritual matters. The quality of sattva is more inherent to the female, spirituality, refinement. She has more basic kindness and natural ahimsa or harmlessness, which generates less dark karma obstructing the spiritual path. Natural capacity for faith or shraddha and spiritual aspiration. Natural capacity for devotion or bhakti and devotional aspiration. 
essential in the upward ascent of, up the spine. Deeper feeling and more subtle intuition. Above is a summary. Below we will look at their special qualities and advantages in more detail. But now let us confront the special weaknesses the sexes tend to display in terms of the spiritual life. Typical male weaknesses. Addiction to the female form. Tendency to become addicted to sex. Lack of interest in the spiritual and esoteric. Addiction to activity and worldly pursuits. Overly aggressive or combative in nature. Hurtfulness towards others which clouds his karma and hides him from the spiritual truth. Pride, ego, arrogance, lack of humility. Fruitless intellectuality, tendency to become distracted by too many facts, details and fine distinctions. Difficulty in grasping the broad, ineffable, inarticulate sense of things. Enjoyment of arguing over spiritual things. Less capacity for trust and faith. More distance from the childlike consciousness. Less tendency for emotion and devotion. Tendency to believe in only external things. Tendency to view external things as more important, including external things in the spiritual and religious fields. The male and the leader is... The male... A lot of the sentences in this book are, have mistakes. Um... The male is the leader in the attraction to worldliness. When the female becomes corrupted by that influence from males, she also becomes worldly and obsessed with the external. Now, special problems of modern males. Out of touch with Dharma, no spiritual mentors, little contact with spiritual knowledge, grief and addictions from too many wars, being lost in the social fabric because of the things his forebears have done to destroy the social fabric, demoralization, confusion, addictions, etc. Basically, males today are much more set adrift, lost at sea, than males of the past because of the sins of the forefathers. I'm sure a lot of men or males listening can relate to this. Basically, I see semen retention and, and sexual restraint as like one of the main ways for men to to undo that that loss, you know, that that grief, that being set adrift or lost, that sea feeling, you know, like it's about coming back into your sexual power and into your power in general, learning to cultivate your sexuality. <clears throat> learning to cultivate your seed and transmute that into creative, confident, powerful energy. That basically acts as the bedrock or the foundation of all other positive change in your life. I intend to work with men sometime in the future. I don't know how soon it will materialize, but it is my intention to work with men and to help them to to overcome some of these problems and it is my intention that semen retention and sexual restraint would form the bedrock or the the focal point of any work together you know that's where a man would have to start and I'm learning that through my own experience that I'm just seeing how much semen retention and sexual restraint is is uh, starting to affect change in my life for the better. I'll cover that more in another video though. <clears throat> the special male advantages. More intensity when finally turning to the spiritual. Natural capacity for detachment, dispassion, vairagya. Greater ability to renounce the world and its pleasures which clears the way for the perceptions of the subtle worlds. Better intellectual comprehension of scriptures. Better faculty of discrimination to comprehend the subtle and important differences between one thing and another and between truth and falsehood. Ability to immediately begin building up the store of ojas to conserve sexual energy. A more natural tendency to silence, economy of words, which conserves his life force and reduces his entanglements, improving his sadhana. 
The male has a lot of grit and endurance. This becomes key in the difficult battle of stilling the mind. Less addiction to others, to crowds, relationships, more natural inclination to be alone. More tendency to read scriptures and imbibe the words of the ancient saints because of his intellectual nature. Better ability to explicate the spiritual truths to others, to write about them, to speak about them in a way that the rational mind can comprehend with more verbal acuity. Females can demonstrate excellent verbal acuity also, but the most verbally impressive females are often women who grow up with exposure to verbally skillful males. Excellent ability to stand on principle regardless of desire and thus preserve integrity and conscience. The male should lean heavily on these natural advantages and thereby easily overcome negative traits. The typical female weaknesses. Addiction to relationships, even when they don't serve her or draw her to the spiritual path. Too much attachment to the social aspects of sadhana and the group, as opposed to the solitude where the serious sadhana needs to take place. Too much attachment to other people and the world in general. Too much sorrow when not in a relationship. More difficulty really renouncing the world. Too much attachment to materiality and sensuality. Less intellectual acuity. Lack of intellectual depth, inner spiritual interest and understanding. Tendency to be disinterested in the facts, the details or finer distinctions. Tendency to overgeneralize and miss important details. Lack of stamina for intense sadhana. Tendency to talk and waste words in fruitless and trivial talk. Tendency to be easily fooled or too easily impressed. Lack of discrimination when pursuing spiritual teachers. More of a tendency to be duped. Less ability to explicate the spiritual truths to others, write about them, speak about them in a way that the rational mind can comprehend. Less verbal acuity for making things clear to herself or others. Confusion. Less tendency to read scriptures and imbibe the words of the ancient saints because of her less intellectual nature. Now, I know that can sound maybe triggering for f females if they're watching, but what it's saying essentially is that women are more emotionally inclined, whereas men are more logically inclined. Special problems of modern females, tendency to overvalue the male things, externalization, external power, rajasic activity, and lose hold of the inherently female and sattvic things, tendency to buy into the worldliness of males and their delusions that worldly power can bring happiness. So that whole sentence there just encapsulates, encapsulates third wave feminism or the modern feminist movement which seeks to masculinize females and put them into the male work workforce um, to compete, uh, which is also a hallmark of masculinity competition. A basic tendency to pursue desires, to put desires first, to abandon dharmic duty in pursuit of desires, which brings bad karma and blocks her spiritual path. A basic belief that men are inferior based on so many generations of experience with corrupt men. General ignorance and incomprehension, along with males, of the sacredness of sex, the true purpose of sex, the purpose and sacredness of the male sexual fluid, and the negative effects of adharmic sex on the male. The females of the past did not suffer from this ignorance as much as today. Pride, ego, arrogance, lack of humility. This was not a problem with the female in the past, but has come about because of the low condition of the male. Tendency to be intimidated by the male and threatened by the male and to want to compete with him in his territory. Disingenuousness results. Lack of spiritual mother roles who had good contact with the special feminine powers of consciousness. Lack of good male spiritual role models and lack of saints in general. Lack of ability to be faithful to anything or to stand our princi on principle over the desire, thus the spoiling integrity and disrupting our conscience. This is a new trend in females. Tendency toward the desire for fame and worldly influence. The special female advantages. <clears throat> a basically more sattvic nature than males. More natural inclination to pursue the spiritual than typical males. 
a better conscience, more sensitive conscience, more subtle sensitivities which can help in realizing the most subtle, natural kindliness towards others which improves her karma and opens the way to spiritual knowledge and spiritual truth, natural capacity for trust and faith, shraddha. Though lacking intensity, the female has a stable, constant nature over time that ultimately that allows her to ultimately attain. Great capacity for trust and faith, great capacity for devotion, better intuition, ability to put the intellect aside and grasp that which the intellect, intellect cannot grasp, ability to have a simple, uncomplicated, childlike mind. The female should lean heavily on these advantages and thereby easily overcome negative traits. Now, after having stated my opinion that the male and female are basically equal, I want to write for entertainment about the growing ethos in the West today that the female is actually superior to the male in all realms including the spiritual field. This is a very interesting phenomenon today and needs some comment. I want to make some observations about the situations of men and women from the point of view of scripture, history and the strange modern situations cr created by the ignorance of males today. Here I will say some things that offend some female egos. At the end I will say some things that perhaps please them. An outstanding feature of our modern culture now is the rampant and socially acceptable self-worship of the female. Everywhere the female celebrates herself. Even a cursory look at literature, art, drama and the female apparently is coming to view herself as superior to the male. Some might claim this as a kind of backlash or balancing of the scales, but it goes beyond that. A woman now rampantly refers to herself as goddess. Bookstores are full of books celebrating womanhood. You will see the books about sisters, but few about brothers. You see the books about the goddess as applies to, applied to ordinary earthly women, but men don't call themselves gods. You see seminar after seminar in which women celebrate their spirituality or their sensuality, or their women's mysteries. Any activity referring to the male mysteries is generally mocked, laughed at. Women celebrate their bonding, but generally when a female speaks of male bonding, she does so sarcastically and derisively. This notwithstanding that the male bonding of the past is what brought her her culture, her protection, the entire material world she lives in. Women are touted everywhere. Teams in the media and drama are popular in which women excoriate men, mock men, and even physically attack men. The bizarre notion is even being developed in our society that there are no physical differences between men and women. Violent and aggressive female characters are presented repeatedly in media as having physical prowess over men, beating them up, killing them, and making mayhem everywhere. This has extended even to our military and the ranks of the warrior are being diluted by the female. It has even become taboo in our military to acknowledge the obvious facts of a woman's generally weaker physique and less intrepid and enduring psychological nature. This extends to young women and everywhere where girls celebrate themselves as girls. You will see t-shirts and bumper stickers saying girl this or girl that, but you don't see boys celebrated this way by adults or boys celebrating themselves as boys. This has to be considered an extraordinary situation, given most of human history was the acknowledged superiority of the male throughout most of our past simply a misunderstanding? Did our indigenous and ancient forebears normally attributed with extraordinary powers of perception of both natural law and human nature simply get it wrong and make a mistake in this one area, assuming as they did the superiority of the male? As spoken earlier, it is certainly remarkable if one scans the context out of which our various cultures emerged to see this modern worship of herself by the female. As mentioned, everywhere we hear in modern culture about the goddess, it is popular and socially acceptable now to use the term goddess and less to use the term god. Even women have become more comfortable referring to themselves as goddess. However, if a man were to refer to himself as a god, he would be criticized. Is the female here cheapening the idea of the term goddess, or is this simply a reflection of the modern female worship of herself as she elevates herself above men? 
It is especially interesting how the female is even inserting herself into the ground of mystical religion, once the province of the male, and occupying it with such certainty. Everywhere we see photos of modern females sitting in the yogi's posture, as if ascetics pursuing renunciation. It has been very hip for women to present themselves in the posture of the yogi and the ascetic in lotus position, etc. In fact, the male form is featured less often in these contexts now than the female. The female form surely dominates this field now in the West. Knowing mystical and religious history and who gave us yoga, this is a very strange phenomenon indeed. Everywhere I see photos and depictions of these modern American females in ascetic poses. However, it seems that part of this trade is nothing but glamour and self-aggrandizement. Verily, in real life I don't meet women who in themselves actually are in pursuit of the yogi's goal or the ascetic's goal. In fact, meeting one of these renunciant females, such as at a yoga retreat, can produce all kinds of snits and woman spurned dramas if a man shows insufficient interest in romance and sex. That central goal of yoga is chitta vritti nirodha, or stopping the mind, but I find that most females have little interest in this. In fact, even among female yoga types, the subject of meditation seems to bore them utterly. The actual desire to practice renunciation and austerities as inherent to the posture of the yogi seems to be not in evidence in the mind of the American female. Is the female actually superior to the male, as apparently now believed in our culture and media? Were most peoples of the past simply mistaken in their observations? Were they just following assumptions that were forced on them? Did the male simply commandeer his superior position through aggression or violence? Or was there truth in the idea of the superiority of the male? Saints and sages of the present and past seem to abide with some assumptions about, if not the superiority of the male, at least the differences between the sexes. Buddha refused to ordain nuns and took only monks. Krishna and the other scriptures always speak in terms of he, him, etc. All of Ramakrishna's ordained men were ordained disciples were men. The Swami orders of India generally accept only males. Why is it that the great founders of the religions have all been males? Why is it that over 90% of influential saints and yogis have been men? Then in the religions they found and in the scriptures they leave behind, a special place is always assigned to the male. This includes Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Yoga, the Baha'i faith and of course Islam. It also includes the many offshoots including the mystical varieties like Sufism that originate within the main religions. Was all of this simply due to the social conventions that have been erroneously put into place by the mistakes of our ancestors? Conventions that gave less opportunity for women to become avatars and found great religions. Now that these conventions are all being torn down, will we see many saints and avatars emerge who are women to correct this sorry situation of the past, which was set up only by the unfortunate misunderstanding of our ancestors? Or is there indeed something fundamental that lies at the core of history, at the core of nature itself, that did indeed elevate men over women? Could it be that this lay in the natural order of things? Could it be that today the natural order of things also dictates that women should now worship themselves and think that they are superior to men? Answers. Answer one. The woman is indeed the receptacle of the male, including the receptacle of his ignorance. As long as men are ignorant, women will necessarily become ignorant. The ignorance of women is grounded in and based in and a reflection of the ignorance of the male. Again, as long as men are ignorant, women must be ignorant. As long as the male is lost, the female will be lost. As long as the male is deluded, so long will the female be deluded. This law can be stated also in some other ways. When the male for a long time worships the female form, the female will necessarily come to worship her own form. When the male for a long time practices idolatry of the female form, the female will come to view herself as an idol. When the female form for a long time has power over men, the female will eventually come to have power over men. 
when the male over a long period of time believes in de facto terms that the female form is God, the female will ultimately regard herself as God and will have to mock and despise the male down to her very bones. When the male is ignorant for a long time, the female will become even more profoundly ignorant. The ancients always regarded the female as the receptacle of the male. This was not just meant in the crass terms that she received his sacred creative essence. This is also intended to describe the way that she is a receptacle of the consciousness of the male and reflects back to the male his consciousness. As the receptacle of the male, the female simply continues to play this role today, but only now she is the receptacle of his ignorance. Because the male has been so ignorant so long to his true nature, the female is now ignorant about her true nature. Because the male thinks the female body is important, she now feels also that it is very important, powerful, with a supernatural hold and power over males. She now believes this profoundly because in today's milieu, this is her actual experience. How could she not feel this way today? She is actually helpless and has to feel this way today. Woman has long been dismayed, amused and even confused by the power of her body to hold such sway over the male. After all, the male seemed to be such a powerful being, yet this powerful being seems to be completely overcome by her body, even abandoning his integrity and his sense. How could she not eventually view herself as a god? Whenever man becomes ignorant and immoral, woman will automatically attain dominance over him and obtain a superior position. Because the male has long been sunk into a state of ignorance and depravity, woman now takes social and cultural precedence over him. This is natural law, a natural outcome of the male's ignorance and depravity. It is also an outcome of the other sins of the male, who has long enjoyed such power. This includes his, includes his arrogance, abusiveness and criticism of the woman, and his killing ways which have created so many wars, killed so many good men, and tragically disturbed the fabric of society in such ways that the natural order was deranged. It also very much is a consequence of the male's infidelity and sexual sin accruing over generations. The growing dominance now of the female is indeed a direct outcome of the sin of the male, who was given a high station but abused that station. The female, though she appears to sport and play, drunken in the atmosphere of her supposed superiority today, is actually inwardly dismayed and confused by her situation. The higher self of the female knows that something is very wrong. Inwardly the female is in great grief because by default, by default of the male to assume the helm of his own spiritual and moral station. The female cannot in fact occupy the position that the male was meant to occupy. Without this spiritual male in the world, the female is in fact bereft, leaderless and lonely. In fact, the female today has a hard time finding a male who can be a spiritual companion to her. So debased is the male. And the female, with her innate purpose of companionship, will always be in sorrow over the lack of a companion at a spiritual level. She can really have no greater sorrow than this, so she fills the void with this contemporary drunkenness in which she imagines herself as superior, as an inherent goddess compared to the relatively mortal male. This is the false drug that fills her void. It is as if a special class of superior graduates has access and to a great and awesome power, but have forgotten how to use it or to employ it. The undergraduates look at them confused in body revelry creating havoc everywhere and are inwardly upset. Because the grads don't know how to operate the system, nothing is done for the benefit of others. Some women know the spiritual potential of the male, but they can't, sell, they can't themselves be the male. When no one is able to master and utilize the higher spiritual potential offered to the male by his own sexual nature, everybody is actually losing. In the higher self of the female, Despite her worship of herself, she is profoundly disturbed, confused and aggrieved by her quote-unquote superiority. Answer 2. 
Male brilliance and energy creates the appearance of female equality. One of the distinctive things about the male is that he alters the material world profoundly. Because of his superior intellectual prowess, his stamina, and his ability to work so hard, males are able to do extraordinary things. He is even able to do things that affect the world at large and change everyone's physical living arrangements. The male also has a natural instinct to protect the female and improve her situation. Combining these two facts, we get extraordinary happenings in the material world, generally created by males. Men have created a world in which women's physical and emotional deficiencies are mitigated and obscured. Most of the important material developments in recorded history were developed and inaugurated by males, and many of these have altered the situation for women in such a way that the female's natural inferiorities are cloaked, obscured, or made to appear irrelevant. An example would be the automobile, created, developed, and manufactured originally by males. Today you can see the roads filled with females driving cars. In modern culture the car has become like an extension of the body for most people. At the actual physical level, a male can run faster than a female. A male can carry a heavier physical burden. A male can endure and walk longer than a female. This is the fact that was once obvious before males invented so many things. But when a woman now steps into the car made by her brothers and fathers, she becomes equal in these areas. She can go just as fast as anyone else, just as far as anyone else. So males created a device that benefits the woman so much that it technologically equalizes her. There is nothing in our world that affects our world today more than technology. And in every major case, males are behind it. Is that simply because of a false inequality pushed upon women for millennia, giving her less opportunity to invent cars, develop steel industries and invent light bulbs? Or does the preponderance of males in these fields spring from the nature of things? In the past several decades, women have had legal equality everywhere, even preferential treatment. But consider the technological invention that now dominates the world, the one that has supplanted in importance Henry Ford's automobile and is now affecting life more than any other thing, the computer. And who is behind the development of the computer and software? Males. In fact, it is commonly known that there is a distinct maleness about the corporate culture of Microsoft Corporation, not to mention its male history. Is this another sort of mistake, only a result of male oppression, even in this day when women are so free? Why is it that female programmers are so fewer than males? Why is it that the female is naturally not attracted to computers and software, even in the same way she has not been attracted to gears, differentials and carburetors? Is this just another trick of oppressive males, or does it represent fundamental differences between men and women in general? Again, with computers, just like the first typewriter invented by another male, the computer is a great equalizer at one level. It is something anybody with a little brains can use, so both men and women can do all kinds of important work with it. In earlier times, most quote unquote men's work was indeed something the average female could not perform. But here, men have altered, men have so altered the nature that work is something quite accessible to, to the woman. So she can go into the workplace, so strangely attractive to today's woman, and do corporate work instead of her own more varied and meaningful work. Again, males have created a situation in which her differences can be obscured or made less relevant. Many examples of this can be cited. Aside from technological realms, we could also cite examples of business prowess and might in which males have altered economies in our culture. Again, the list of history's business moguls is almost entirely male. But the main point here is that men themselves, through their powerful abilities and instinct to help and improve situations, have created an entire culture in which the natural weaknesses of the female can become obscured or less relevant. So here it is, the actual superiority of the male in certain realms of life that makes it possible for the female to sport and play and have her adventures in quote unquote equality. <laughs> so there's another chapter then after that which which goes kind of further on the same topic and um, some of it repeats. I'll try to read out just those bits that are um, novel.
In the preceding piece I wrote that the male and female each has special advantages and liabilities in spiritual life. Now I need to comment about men and women another way. When the male is sunk into sexual addiction, he comes to worship the female in de facto terms. When the male becomes the troll to the female, to the female, vast changes take place in society and civilization itself. I want to comment on some of the aspects of these changes today. Many absurd situations are developing and need comment. Because the male has sunken into thraldom to sex, he is becoming sunk into thraldom to the female. Because he has become sunk in thraldom to the female and no longer occupies his natural high station as a human being, modern females have actually come to believe themselves superior to men in all sorts of ways and act as if it were so. In view of the testimony of history and scripture, we have embarked upon very strange times. Okay, so he's kind of repeating what he said in the last chapter about, you know, the prevalence of female worship in society these days. Um, how women tend to glamorize and aggrandize themselves. Not all women, of course, but the general trend is that it's more moving in that direction these days. Um, and how that's stemming basically from males current sex addiction and obsession with sex and how they covet the female form and basically how, how the female is a receptacle of male consciousness so she reflects back to, to man his, his own state so it goes without saying then that as men have fallen and become so lowly and sex addicted women by default could not help do otherwise but reflect that back and you know, start to worship their own bodies, start to see themselves as goddesses, um, and even start to hold some contempt for men because of how degenerate they are, essentially. So he's covering pretty much that in this next chapter again. That's one fault I found with this book, actually, was that he tended to repeat certain segments. Okay, so this part seems to be fresh here. And now this is talking about kind of the return movement, so men becoming pure again and what that's going to entail. So the one who restrains himself sexually is the primal conservationist. All conservationist powers are grounded in that. He conserves and holds sacred the very th highest thing found in nature, the human creative seed. Better than a thousand heirloom seed collectors is this man who preserves his sexual essence. Better than a thousand Sierra Clubs are ten celibate men. The, the Sierra Club is a conservationist, naturalist organization that was set up in California in the 1800s to protect certain habitats there. I believe the founder's surname was Sierra, so that might have been what way it got that name. So better than a thousand Sierra Clubs are ten celibate men. And the celibate naturally has a respect for all of nature and the ethic not to waste and damage nature. You know, it just makes so much sense to me that the man who decides to respect his own sacred essence and preserve it, conserve it, cherish it, will inevitably go on to develop a, a cherishment and a, a respect and a desire to protect and preserve and uplift nature. As within, so without. As below, so above. The man's respect for his own body and its sacredness spreads naturally to the larger field of nature. The celibate is a natural respecter of nature. Conversely, the one with a genuine reverence for nature would naturally re revere his own original purity. There are two basic dynamics that are leading man to destroy the planet. The first has to do with his ignorance and can be called the dog with a bag problem. Most have seen how a dog behaves towards an empty bag with a scent of food in it dog tears up the bag, ultimately leaving it in little shreds. This is exactly what mankind is now doing to the planet and nature's vital meshings, tearing it all to shreds. Mankind does this for the exact same reason that the dog tears the bag to shreds. He thinks there is something there. Like the bag, the world has the scent of God. That makes man think that there is something here, something that will ultimately make him happy. But the truth is, nothing in the material world and no sensual feeling, no sensual pleasure can ever satisfy man because man is spirit. I like that because it draws the distinction between pleasure 
and true happiness or fulfillment. Pleasure does not equal happiness. Pleasure is a sensation of the body that comes and goes. It's very fleeting. True fulfillment is more divine. It's more sacred. It's more more fulfilling. You know, it's just it resonates on a much deeper level. It's more nourishing. It's completely different. But like the dog who believes tearing up the bag will eventually yield him a taste that will satisfy, man restlessly tears into the earth. He roams far and wide like a vandal. He searches for more land and minerals to provide more stuff, which yields him more falls and temporary trills. He quests for more food, more women, more trills, more power, a better car to penetrate deeper and desecrate pristine nature, and so on. Whenever he realises that he still has no satisfaction, he always imagines that some other conquest, another mine, another horizon, another invention, that these will hold the answer. These have never proved to hold any answer, but man restlessly quests onward. Now he has the delusion that the happiness that eludes him will somehow be found in space, and he is spending millions now attempting thus to penetrate further into the empty material world. The great saint Neem Karoli Baba was sitting and was told that the Westerners had just sent a satellite to Mars. He just laughed and laughed. Once man realises that there is really nothing here that will satisfy him, he ceases to rape, pillage and destroy the material creation. For now, he's a dog tearing things apart in his ignorance. The second reason that man is destroying the planet is related to his ignorance, but needs to be described more acutely. That is, man's many addictions to material things. He not only has the delusional belief that things in the material world will satisfy him, but also an addiction to those unsatisfactory things. Like the alcoholic who keeps drinking liquor, even though it gives him no benefit, man has become attached to possessions and assorted thrills that also give him no benefit. And it happens that in order for man to keep obtaining many of these possessions and thrills, he must tear the planet apart. The spirit of... The spirit of renunciation dissolves both of these ghosts. When one renounces, he realises that he doesn't really need the things he once sought. Then after renouncing, one is able to experience pleasures that are independent of the material world. He finds that these pleasures are superior to the old ones. Involvement with the material pleasures made it impossible to experience the finer spiritual pleasures. Now with time, the renunciate becomes established in these finer joys and is satisfied. He no longer must quest far and wide, violating nature. Thus renunciation is the spirit that allows man to cease from destroying the planet. One can see this powerful dynamic benefiting many simple people in all walks of life even today. Anyone who simply consumes less and leads a simple life is a renunciate and noble. This assists the earth greatly. Because sexual celibacy is one of the highest forms of renunciation, celibate monks and nuns and secular people of restraint and are the precursors as well as founding cornerstone of conservation impulses. The man or woman pursuing celibacy or the, the individual who at least tries to get his discharges down to no more than once a month is hewing closer to the pattern of nature. So that also includes the man who's pursuing semen retention or sexual restraint in general, not just pure celibacy. Not even animals rot and breed indiscriminately at all hours. Not even animals use their creative powers for pleasure or as a drug to make themselves feel good or divorce from the creative purpose or sex. When man sexes himself beyond cyclical parameters seen in nature, know verily that he has fallen from his high evolutionary perch When a man or woman pursues sexuality, divorced from its creative intent, they have, verily, fallen beneath an animal. And that is the end of the chapter and the end of the book, actually, because those chapters were at the end of it. So I thought that was, that's incredibly insightful. You know, he talks about the the advantages of the male and the female spirituality, or in spirituality, the advantages, or the disadvantages of the male and the female. <clears throat> special disadvantages of men and women in modern society since modern society has degraded further he also talks about the dynamic in present society about how men's worship of the female form 
has led to uh, the woman seeing herself as a goddess and has led to this fake superiority of women in um, society. And it's a superiority that is like a, a very shallow prize for women, you know. Many women in their delusion today, they think that it's great for women to be on the ascent and to be becoming the reigning goddesses on the planet, self-assigned goddesses, but really it's a very hollow prize and they're all quite uh, lost and confused and spiritually missing that strength of the spiritual male and his, his role in society. And really the only thing that's going to reverse this whole trend and put things back into the natural order is um, this whole area of sexual restraint and you know semen retention that is really the key <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier in the video I see semen retention as the focal point of any positive improvement for men you know it's the it's, the, it's ground zero it's the starting point it's what leads to everything else improving <clears throat> the semen is the sacred white essence of man what gives him his power is confidence when squandered it leads to lack of confidence doubt lack of material success lack of focus inability to connect with others inability to connect with the female in contrast, when a man preserves his seed and cultivates it and transmutes his sexual energy into higher creative pursuits every kind of abundance imaginable comes to that man gradually but increasingly and that's just an individual man's life when men do that collectively and I believe that this movement is coming this wave is coming of awakening that um, men will take back their power massively on the planet and they'll start becoming moral again virtuous consistent in their word deeds and actions and um, our thoughts, words and deeds and as a result of that you know it says here you know remember how it says that females are the receptacle of male consciousness you know females this may offend some women but I truly believe that woman is meant to be the companion of man you know the supporter of man and the reflector of man's consciousness you know that doesn't mean that one is superior than the other it just means that man is intended to be the more active principle the masculine you know it goes out into the world it, it achieves things it's, it's <clears throat> it builds things you know and that, that's also the masculine principle operating in some women and in all women in, in to, a, to a certain extent that is the masculine principle but of course that's best embodied and, and more most frequently embodied by men Whereas the feminine is more about, you know, support, it's about reflection, it's about nourishment, it's about family, it's about connection, community, relationships. And I believe that, you know, women will come back naturally into that role as men retain their seed and as they come back into their virtue, their morality, their honour, their courage, their strength, their compassion. And women will start to reflect back to men their own growing virtue. <coughs> women will become more virtuous too. <coughs> Um, and both the sexes will become like less and less addicted to sex they'll become more restrained and sex will become a truly sacred thing again you know um, who is to say whether a society will move in like a, a very celibate direction only keeping sex for procreation I'm not so sure that it will but at the very least I think um semen retention will become widely practiced by all men you know like men will recognize the sacredness of their seed and the importance of preserving it um, for their benefit and for everyone else's and I believe that uh, the focus in sex will be taken off ejaculation that things like karetsa, tantra um, Taoist practices will become more common and we'll cultivate our own new versions of this and new knowledge and a lot more will come to the surface and come to the forefront a lot more will be revealed and basically yeah, I believe that you know humanity is headed for really great things I'm a, I'm a pure optimist in this regard I think that humanity is waking up and that you know that the practices that we need are coming to us as we need them and you know men are starting to figure out about their the true power of their sexuality now and learning to cultivate that and that's 
that suggests great things for the future and for the world, you know. And um, I'm really looking forward to the reascent of the of the male, um, the spiritual, moral male, and his leadership in society. And I'm looking forward to women coming back into their femininity and embracing their femininity and not being ashamed of it and um, reflecting back to men their growing virtue. If you if you're interested to hear more about my thoughts on the future of society in a in a positive light check out my video on my channel um, called What Might a Highly Evolved Society on Art Look Like? where I covered in depth. You might enjoy that too. I also did a video about Kretze. It was the very first video I uploaded to the channel. Check that out. Um, and also, if you haven't yet, um, check out the first video for this. Um, although I advise to watch the first one before this one. Uh, regarding the bliss of the celibate it was the previous upload to this one so if you enjoyed this video subscribe to my channel I'm going to be uploading videos regularly on a wide array of topics pertaining to spirituality personal development humanity society and really what the channel is all about is just building up a framework of truth <coughs> the, the most complete picture of truth that I can assemble regarding the human diet, human sexuality, society, <clears throat> how we've been duped, how we can become free, what a future connected society will look like, the nature of reality, these kind of things, you know, practices that can be helpful, what's helped me in my journey, sharing in my journey on a more personal level. So a lot of amazing stuff is, is going to be produced on this channel subscribe and if you like this video give it a thumbs up comment as well if you have any thoughts of your experience in this regard with semen retention or celibacy or your thoughts on the book or this passage and i i look forward to sharing with you more in the future and um yeah i'll see you in the next video thanks for watching